Phantom income and phantom capital gains are things that exist inside of your portfolio that increase additional fees and expenses, obviously make you take more risk for a similar return, but most importantly, they add taxes to your tax return that doesn't go away. We're going to talk about phantom capital gains and things that go bump in the night in your portfolio on Consider This Program today. Well, good morning and welcome back to Consider This Program. I am your host, Joe Clark. And I'm Darren Hardesty. <clears throat> Happy to have you along. Darren is one of our senior advisors in uh, the Lafayette <clears throat> office occasionally, mm-hmm. you know, but mostly Anderson, Fishers, and every now and then Brownsburg. Uh, happy to have you along, Darren. Hey, we've got a theme for this week for Halloween. You know, if you are listening to it on Halloween, great. If not, just understand that that's when the show was aired. Uh, and the theme is uh, the theme is about things that can really um, scare you if you're aware of them. You know, rarely are we scared of things that we're aware of. We're scared of things we're not aware of. Sure. Right now, you know, you actually see the guy with the gun, you might be scared. Yeah. Right. But most of the time. <laughs> What we worry about are things that never come to fruition. We know that psychologically. We know that we're, you know, everywhere we are. So you wanted to walk through a couple things. So let, let's, first of all, let's start with phantom capital gains. What are those? That's a happy Halloween, Joe. So, happy uh, Halloween. So phantom capital gains, it has a spooky sound to it, and uh, it's it definitely is catchy. Uh, and it gets people's attention. I, I can think of uh, multiple meetings where we've discussed this with people and it's caught their attention and helped them understand um, that mutual funds, for one reason or another, may not make as much sense. But a phantom capital gain is when you pay taxes on something that you have not sold. So if you're inside of a mutual fund and there's somebody else that's involved inside of that mutual fund, uh, it's an open-end mutual fund like most are, uh, if somebody goes in and says, hey, you know, can I actually wanna... be a closed end too, by the way. Okay. Something I, I learn something new every day. So um, me too. <laughs> that's right. So if somebody goes in, like you're part of this mutual fund is with all these other thousands of other people. And let's say a bunch of them say, I want to sell shares of my, of what I own inside of that mutual fund. Some of my units that I own inside of there. Well, if the money manager or the manager of that fund has to go in and sell different positions because technically he doesn't or she doesn't have to sell anything. They may have capital that they can pay out. They may not have to sell any positions. But typically, if it's a large amount, they're going to go in, sell some of the stock positions inside of that mutual fund. And what that's going to do is if there's any gain that is there, everybody inside of that mutual fund shares in those gains. And so whether you sold or not, if you're the person that's sitting there not selling, you're just holding on just like everybody else that didn't sell, well, guess what? You're going to find some uh, phantom capital gains that might show up on your return. And what's tough about that, Joe, is that you don't see that typically until the end of the year. So those are, those gains don't necessarily have to be reported until after December 31st. So if you're tax planning and you are estimating how much you can do a Roth conversion and you're trying to look at AGI, a lot of times if you have a lot of mutual funds and we're trying to plan around that, it becomes very difficult because all of a sudden these gains that we weren't expecting to pay taxes on hit the return, and now it's kind of messed up the entire tax plan uh, that we had in place, or it exposes you to more taxes than what we intended you to, to have to pay. I'll give you a B plus. Seems like I get okay. a lot of B pluses on this show. That's and you okay. got, um, well, <laughs> you used six or seven words that I don't know that are common to people. Most okay. people don't talk about, talk about capital, mm-hmm. right? Um, that would be one. And two, actually, they tell you about in October, late October, November, what those capital gains are, which is why it is repulsive to me that anybody would sell a mutual fund to somebody after that period of time and have yeah. that thrown on their tax return, mm-hmm. right? The, the salespeople that do that just should be, you know, kind of smacked around. Sure. <clears throat> Understand, we're not talking about a, a 401k or an IRA. We're talking about a mutual fund that you have that's outside of that. Correct. Right. And and the best that some of the best examples that I can give uh, inside of this. And when I tell you B plus, you should be proud. Okay. Um, I think it was 2000. I think it was 2006 or seven. I had to explain this to a bunch of CPAs how it worked. And they looked at me and told me I was an idiot. <clears throat> it's like, no, this is how the tax code works. And they did not understand why people were getting the 1099s that they were getting. Mm-hmm. That's the tax return that it's, it's formed on. I think most CPAs, if not all of them, understand this now um, because it's now so prevalent. <clears throat> but let's say that you had, and remember, a mutual fund trades at an NAV. It's a net asset value. Right. So whether it's an open-end or a closed-end fund, at the end of the day, 
the manager is going to tell you what the value of your unit is worth. And so that's, this is one of the confusing parts in a mutual fund. <clears throat> Salespeople will tell you that you have a fiduciary. Well, the, you have a fiduciary inside of that mutual fund, but his fiduciary or her fiduciary obligation is actually to the trust, not to Darren, not, not to his wife, not to his kids. It's to the trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say it's a, a large cap growth fund and he made the decision to buy Apple back in 2006, right? Mm -hmm. So his adjusted basis or her adjusted basis inside of the trust itself is less than $9 a share. <clears throat> I know because that's when we bought Apple the first time, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say we're now at 2021 and you finally decided, hey, I think life's good. And in, in June, you put money into this mutual fund, right? Mm-hmm. And the market went down, right? But you didn't sell, but your neighbor did, right? So imagine this, ladies and gentlemen, you didn't sell anything. You put in, let's say the NAV, the net, the net asset value was $10 a unit when you bought it. It's now down to nine. The manager had to come up with distributions. That's what he meant by capital to be able to pay off the people who wanted their money out because that's the obligation. They chose to sell Apple. <clears throat> Right. Yep. Inside of the trust fund, Apple had a long term capital gain. Right. And right. you put in 10. It's now worth nine. Right. And all of a sudden you're going to get a 1099 if you don't sell at the end of the year. You didn't have a loss. You have a, actually have a loss on paper. Yeah. But you have a long term capital gain you have to recognize. Yeah. And if that doesn't scare you. Right. It's <clears throat> it's stuff that is, like you said, is very complicated. Most people don't think about it. They, I think most people just go along to get along, and they think, well, that I'm going to Everybody else is doing it, so it's got to be okay. Right. It's just, uh, you know, this, it's got to be fair. They wouldn't do this to me. But in the end, you not knowing the rules to the game, makes a, it makes a big difference. It's a big reason, one of the many reasons why at the Financial Enhancement Group we use exchange-traded funds, uh, because it, it cuts out the potential for phantom capital gains, uh, the transparency of an exchange-traded fund, um, it, it allows us as money managers and fiduciaries to make sure that we're we're doing what's best for your in, in your interest and not in ours, um, and we are fiduciaries to you, not to the the fund itself. So, right. the next uh, topic is phantom income, and as somebody who's been in uh, student debt, who's had student debt in the past, uh, one of the most common things that uh, we talk about with phantom income is debt forgiveness programs. Now. Typically, if it's a federally sponsored debt forgiveness plan, you don't have to worry about this, but phantom income can actually occur if you have a program at work where they say, hey, we're going to pay off your debt. If you work for us for five years uh, and you've been a good employee, any of your student loan debt, we'll pay that off. Well, it sounds great, but if, the, if it is not structured properly, you may have to add that to your AGI as income for getting that debt paid off. And I haven't personally run into that, but I know that it has occurred more uh, more often in the past. But that's something to really consider if you're in a program like that, that getting that debt forgiven, great. But if it's a $50,000 debt, well, $50,000 may or may not be added to your AGI for the year, which means more taxes that you were not expecting. You've seen this happen once in your life and once in your career. Okay. <clears throat> so in your career were the PPP loans last year. Okay. Where they originally said, we're going to give you money if you qualify based on keeping employees and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. Right. And we're going to forgive the debt. Right. Right. And the IRS came out and said, well, you can forgive the debt, but we're going to tax it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The forgiveness of debt is a taxable issue. This, and, and so so far, right now, it's not a taxable issue. Right. right? That's, that's where we are right now. Back in 2008 eight, eight, nine, in the housing crisis, where they came up with all these programs to get people out of the debt. Mm -hmm. Right? You were teaching. Right? Yep. Just starting. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't an issue you probably had to worry about. But they, had to, they forgave a lot of, those, the, of the mortgage debt which is technically taxable. Yeah. And that would have just made the snowball be even worse. And so at the, as of this point, it's not a taxable thing. But if <clears throat> if you owe me 20 grand and I write it off, right? Yeah. You you're going to get a 1099 for 20 grand, Mr. Hardesty. And it just goes to show it nothing is as good as it seems. Um, and you should always be very careful about what's hiding, uh, our Halloween theme, what's hiding behind the curtain, if you will. So may, or underneath the bed, just make sure that you know the rules of the game um, and have people on your side that are going to help you 
break it apart because if you you come to us and you sit down with me in a meeting and say, hey, my employer is going to offer me to forgive this loan or I've got this loan forgiveness program uh, to forgive some of my debt, then isn't that great? Well, yes, it is. But let's make sure we understand what's going to come from that. And that just ha- comes to making sure you know all the rules. So here's what you need to consider for you right now. If you've got mutual funds that you have bought this year or last year that are showing a lost NAV, you need to go to yourlifeafterwork.com, get signed up for a next steps meeting. There are ways out of these phantom capital gains before the end of the year by mm-hmm. recognizing the losses. You do not want to get caught in this mess. While you're there, if you get signed up for that next steps meeting, Darren or Aaron or Grant or Dean or Jamie, one of our advisory team will sit down with you. They'll give you 90 minutes. They'll go through our process. Our, our, it's a trademark process with our family vision, family focused vision. And then we'll go through the five critical elements, your life after work, the annual tax plan, the investment playbook, the life happens. That's where we provide a lot of checklists for the good, bad, and the ugly. And then the legacy plan, of course. They'll give you things to consider today, things you're going to want to consider in your future. And if we choose to partner together, things that we will do for you and we'll put it in writing. On top of that, Darren will give you a 180-day written commitment that says, here's what we're going to do. It's signed by me, the Director of Financial Planning, the Chief Investment Officer, and the Chief Compliance Officer. And we promise to do our best. 800-928-4001.